Today we're going to be talking about feeding the world, feeding a growing population. Um, I want to just make a quick announcement that our guest speaker today was going to be John Schreier from uh, the State Department, but unfortunately he's been called out of town. So um, Jose promises us he's going to come today and tell us about his experiences in Haiti um, in complement to what we're going to be talking about in class today. So um, I want to go ahead and get started. We are very lucky in that um, our first speaker today is Dr. Charles Teller, who is a demographer. Um, he's also an adjunct professor in the Department of Global Health in the GW School of Public Health. Um, he's also, this was very interesting to me, has an adjunct associate professor um, position with the population and de um, development uh, wait, I'm sorry, I'll start this all over again. He is an adjunct associate professor of population and development at the Center for Population Studies at Abbas, Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia. Um, he's been teaching and researching in Ethiopia since 1994, which is, I'm, I'm sure he's going to be telling us about that today. Um, he's also had a really distinguished career. Um, in the course of his career, he served as the Deputy Director of the Population Research Center at the University of Texas at Austin. He's been a sociologist and demographer for the World Health Organization in Guatemala. He's been a capacity building advisor in demographic training and research for UNFPA in Ethiopia. Maybe you'll tell us the acronym what that stands for. He's also been the head of the Population Health Nutrition Unit for the Office of International Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and an evaluation advisor for the Center for Development and Population Activities at USAID. In Ethiopia, he was the Peace Corps uh, country director and also coordinated vulnerability assessments on food insecurity and disease for the research division of the Ethiopian Disaster Prevention and Preparedness Commission. Um, so as you can see, he's very well versed to talk with us today about international food security. He's um, advised the UN, USAID, and government on national food security, nutrition, disaster reduction, population health, and environment policies. So let's welcome Dr. Teller today. Thank you very much. Uh, just get a feel for the audience here. Are, uh, obviously, you see I've been in this uh, field uh, mucking around for uh, five decades. And I'm just wondering, are anyone here, are there people here interested in uh, making a career in issues of food security, hunger, and malnutrition? Hmm, about a third, uh-huh. OK, there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, in the future, the opportunities um, will be more on the prevention side uh, than on the on the security side, because the prevention side um, <clears throat> within sustainable development actually works uh, works better. So I've been given this um, the t the title of this uh, presentation which I wouldn't have chose myself, but since uh, I have to uh, meet the, 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 is it the, the need or the demand, uh, it's called feeding a growing population. Now, you know, I'm a, basically a sociologist, anthropologist, ecologist, and I really don't really like being a feeding others. I think one should help others to feed themselves so you can get the, the gist of it. Uh, I also put here in the uh, subtitle, demographic transitions. That's positive. Transitions are usually positive. Transitions are related to social and economic development. But of course, there are always challenges within transitions. And you know one of the challenges uh, in the nutrition, we'll, we'll deal with one of the biggest challenges in the nutrition transition, which you are dealing with here in the U.S. among the poor population 
um, as well as we are starting to face in the uh, third world countries. Okay, so basically I'm going to give you a sense of, since at least a, thir a third of you are interested in this as a career, a sense of how you get into it and how it's hard to <clears throat> actually get out of it. Um, <clears throat> then, uh, being a demographer, I am a numbers cruncher, so we'll look at the numbers. Um, a growing population, let's look at the numbers, but uh, we're going to be look at the numbers and not only the numbers but the prevalence or the percentages uh, that are uh, also important. Then third, we're going to look at the transition uh, in terms of the context of social, economic, and political development. And then fourth, I'm going to give an Ethiopian case study. We have a Habesha sitting back there, uh, an Ethiopian. Um, and uh, I will, uh, I think I will surprise him by being so positive about the country as being a positive deviant, we call it. Um, and then finally, we'll deal with the, the policies and what you might be, uh, have to uh, uh, address. So, well, in graduate school, I went to Cornell. Cornell has a big uh, food and nutrition, has an ag school, but also has uh, of social science, and in the 60s, we were dealing with what Paul Ehrlich called the population bomb. It was going to explode, and it was going to obviously kill a lot of people. And this led back to so-called the Malthus, the Malthus, uh, the Malthusian theory or a Malthusian uh, dragon. Has anyone here heard of Malthus? Anyone raise their hands? Uh-huh. So what do you think, okay, he's pretty, pretty popular. But what do you think is the Malthusian dragon? Any guesses? What's, a, what's the dragon? What, do we, what have I been trying to do for 50 years about sl uh, slaying this dragon, the Malthusian dragon? Any guesses on what the dragon might be? Well, Malthus said that population, of course, grows exponentially and food just grows arithmetically. So um, people are going to... Uh, uh, as the population keeps growing, people are going to basically die of hunger, <clears throat> if not war. And that was the dragon. The dragon is eating people. Um, um, so that shouldn't happen. And fortunately, it's not happening uh, in general. Uh, it's happening less than it used to. <clears throat> and uh, obviously, I've been in the Horn of Africa for, for many years, and, and it is happening less and less. So. Um, although there is still a, a Somalia there. But um, I think it's important that uh, when you're a graduate student or even undergraduate, you're mainly graduate students, to get involved here domestically, to see the problem here. I understand you, you do take, uh, there are courses here on domestic hunger and poverty. But we were in the 60s dealing with obviously um, the war on poverty. Uh, civil rights, racism, uh, women's lib. <clears throat> and then uh, those of us who went into the, <clears throat> made a choice of Vietnam or the Peace Corps, okay? Well, I chose the Peace Corps. I served my country in, in Bolivia. It wasn't hard to serve your country in Bolivia. such a great, great place. But there, there were so many issues, and um, it was hard to uh, see the uh, solutions. I did get involved in food and nutrition programs there. Took a course at Harvard. A course in the field. But that, uh, because there are so many issues, you know, when you go to grad school, there's so many issues, so many questions you can't answer in, until you go to the field. So, been in the field for, for uh, a long time. So, the first maybe 20 years was in Latin America, uh, in three countries, um, mainly at a WHO as a nutrition institute, probably the, the, the premier nutrition institute of WHO, INCAP in, in Guatemala, but we covered a lot of the countries. Now, Guatemala, unfortunately, has been not such a success story. Still a very high rate of, of stunting, uh, but uh, our research has been used in many other countries, including Cuba, which has been a, obviously a success story in nutrition. Then uh, coming back here in the 80s, well, we got involved in a civil war there. We were kidnapped, hijacked, whatever, and we had a come back here and, and cool it for a while. So I came back to work for DHHS and then USAID. Now UNFPA is the United Nations 
uh, fund for population activity. It's where demographers who are involved in development work. Uh, it's not, FP is not family planning. Uh, USAID. And then uh, advisor for USAID. And then um, took a sabbatical and I was able to you need a sabbatical. So we have here written a book of 20 years of research on the demographic transition development in Africa, but we really do focus on, on, on Ethiopia. And um, finally, then after the, uh, the book, coming here to the GW with working with colleagues and uh, continuing to work in Ethiopia, we also have a, an NGO of, uh, for Ethiopia Americans to give back to the current. We're trying to address maternal mortality. Ethiopia. Okay, so um, again, the numbers, the, the numbers, let's call it the numbers. Is it the numbers that count or the prevalence or the proportion that really counts? So here you see on the left hand side the, the numbers. Okay, here you go. This is the uh, the World Food Summit, and they have a target to cut the number of hungry, or what we call undernourished or food insecure, uh, in half uh, by, from, the, from, two, from 1990, the baseline, actually to 2015, okay? So you hear by, the, by 2013, they're far from meeting the target of cutting the number of food insecure in half. So in terms of the numbers, we're behind this very ambitious target to cut it in half. But in terms of the prevalence of the proportion, which is the MDG, Millennium Development Goal target of the UN, it is to cut the prevalence in half, see from 23% to the target about 12%, 20, all right, 22 to uh, 24 to 12, and we're very close. And it looks like we're gonna meet the target, okay? So we're not gonna meet the target in terms of the number of uh, food insecure, but in terms of the prevalence, cutting it in half from 24 to 12. Uh, we're gonna meet that, all right? So, I ask you to think about what's more important. If you're going to be dealing with uh, trying to address the, this problem, um, are you going to be evaluating what works and doesn't work in terms of reducing the numbers or reducing the, uh, the, the prevalence? Um, this is more than an academic question. It's a very policy-relevant uh, 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 question. I have been focusing more on the prevalence in terms of research and evaluation. It's the prevalence that really, that really counts, like a, a rate, like a mortality rate. But in terms of the, you might say, the politics of a World Food Summit, the politicians are, are very interested in, in, in the numbers and, and in advocacy. So I'm not gonna answer the question what's more important, the numbers or the prevalence, but at least for those of us who are doing research and evaluating, the, the prevalence is more important. This is in that very important reading we assigned of, 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 of FAO. Okay, now, it's very hard to generalize, it's very hard to generalize about uh, uh, hunger, food security, uh, but I prefer this indicator called stunting. Stunting. Does anyone know what stunting is? Child stunting? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's growth retardation from infancy, from birth, to particularly the third year of life, most of the growth retardation. And it's not just growth, it's also cognitive development becomes retarded in that period of two to, first two to three years, uh, and it's irreversible. So the programs to prevent or reduce retardation of growth, or what we call growth faltering, 
uh, are extremely important. Both the, the, this is global, both the numbers, this is the, the numbers, and this is the, the prevalence. <coughs> okay? The, the world, Asia, obviously, with China, predominating in some with India, and Latin America, they have been successful in reducing both the numbers of children who are bajito, who are stunted, uh, and also um, uh, the, the prevalence. But here is Africa, and Africa has been our challenge, and one of the reasons I moved from Latin America to Africa is because in Latin America we saw that the success was coming, that we could apply the lessons learned in, in Africa. So here what we have, here is the, um, here is the, the percentage declining from about 40 in 1990 to about uh, uh, 25, well, right now would be about 30, okay? Uh, so the prevalence, the prevalence is declining, and important countries such as Ethiopia uh, are contributing to that decline, Ghana. Uh, a, a lot of some of the more and more, more developing countries are contributing to that decline. But what do you see down here? This is the numbers. And the numbers of stunted young children, infants and young children, have increased from 45 million to 60, 61. Well, now it's 58, 45 to 58. And it is projected a slight increase by the year 2000. 15. But what we are evaluating is look at this decline from 35 to almost 25 in terms of the, of the prevalence. So obviously you can say I'm an optimist in terms of prevalence, but you have to realize that there are certain countries in Africa, sometimes we call them, uh, uh, we, uh, they're non-functioning non countries non, like DRC Congo or Somalia. Uh, even Nigeria, Nigeria is one of those countries where the, uh, the, 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 the prevalence is not, is not declining. So you go country by country though, the majority, the majority of the countries here. So, in, so while this is the world, <clears throat> both numbers and prevalence going down, uh, dominated by China, China the big success story, uh, to a certain extent India, although India still has a high prevalence of, uh, uh, of, of stunting. Latin America, a big success story, okay? A lot of success stories. But in terms of Africa, that's uh, the big challenge, and that's why I want to give Ethiopian case study. Um, I see my time is fleeting, but I, I want to say that in terms of, of being researchers and being um, uh, academic about really understanding the concept of hunger or food insecurity. FAO used to have basically the availability indicator, D dietary energy supply, DES, or undernourishment. Finally, this year, after all our complaints and criticism, they've added about a few more indicators here of physical economic access, utilization, vulnerability, and shocks, as well as some of the biometric indicators of access and, and utilization. So after many years of just using one indicator, which is wrong and never use just one indicator, uh, when you're looking at a complex situation, they've added maybe too many. Okay, what makes, what makes us fairly optimistic? Um, it's what we call the, the transitions. Now, not all transitions I improve a welfare, but the demographic transition clearly does. And the demographic transition is both the, the dynamic, demographic dynamic. When mortality lowers, it's followed by a lowering of fertility. When fertility lowers, uh, the age in marriage uh, rises, and also there's movement to, to, to urban areas. But not only that, there's increase in secondary education, there's a lower dependency rate, uh, and uh, there is a greater proportion, uh, this concept here, 
a greater proportion of the population and in the working, in working age, so the dependency rate is lower. Though that's a demographic transition that happened in Europe, then it happened in Latin America, then Asia, and now it's happening in some of the countries in Africa, uh, most of the countries, but with a few exceptions. What follows the demographic transition is what we call the nutrition transition. So you're going from bajito to gordito. You're going from uh, skinny and short uh, to overweight, fat and short. Uh, and that's happening, as you know, because of, well, the refined carbohydrates, the sedentary uh, lifestyle, um, and uh, other, and, and, and urbanization. <clears throat> So the d nutrition transition is really following the demographic. Now, I'm not saying that, so the, the, the demographic transition is not necessarily uh, helping it, uh, everybody. I mean, there is a decline in the stunting, which then improves the cognitive, uh, physical, and, and social development. But you do have this transition, nutrition transition, from the overweight, from the underweight to the overweight. So this is a come more of a graphic picture of way, uh, what it used to be, uh, famine and, and stunting, to receding famine. And this is what's happening with the urbanization economic growth. And then comes along the diet-related non-communicable diseases, such as? <coughs> what's a diet-related uh, non-communicable disease? Diabetes. That's great. Diabetes. What else? Hypertension. Yeah, and these are, uh, these are big. Okay, um, it, it's, even though uh, I've been tilting at this Malthusian dragon for many years, in the countries that I've worked, Guatemala, Bolivia, Ethiopia, uh, and others, uh, they're, they're, they're usually beautiful countries in terms of their topography. Uh, but as a demographer ecologist, uh, you, one notices the population pressure and the increasing intensification of the, of the land. Uh, but along with that, the programs to relieve the population pressure. And this is a, a mountainside uh, towards the southern, this is Walaita, uh, in southern Ethiopia, which is the highest density, about 600 people per, per uh, hectare. And uh, I've been noticing over the last 25 years how the, the, the fields are keep creeping, keep, keep creeping up the mountainside. But I've also noticed other things. Don't just look at the creep up. What, I, what I've noticed is, do you see this? See the roof? It's no longer uh, teja, it's no longer hay. It's uh, corrugated iron. That's, that's improvement. You see this? What's that? Electricity. See that? And they also are doing tree farming. There's eucalyptus. So while it looks like there's deforestation uh, and uh, maybe erosion going on, on the other hand, there's that type of, that, that type of social change. These are maps that uh, we worked on to de develop to identify where the most food insecure areas were. And obviously, you can see in the, to the right, uh, that's the horn that goes right into Somalia on the right-hand side. Uh, and in the center is actually the continental divide. And, uh, but on the left is, on the left, the green is rainforest, uh, which they're with their own problems now with increased uh, intensity of, of rainfall. On the right-hand side, more, more frequent droughts. On the left, more uh, rainfall. Okay, this is what we call the Ethiopian paradox. It's a paradox, and that's one thing we deal with here, and we're going to be presenting this more next uh, month um, at a conference in Thailand, actually on climate change, uh, which we can talk about more. The paradox is that from the, up until the 1990s, the, the annual population growth was the percentage was rising from 1% all the way to 3%. When I arrived, it was about 3%. Um, of course, there was also the change of government uh, there. 
Uh, and since then, it has started to uh, up. since then it started to go down. Uh, in terms of though the prevalence of stunting, it was one of the reasons we went there because I led a team in all of for, for all of Sub-Saharan Africa for the UN looking at the most food insecure malnourished countries. In 1990, Ethiopia was the worst. So when we went there, and I just fell in love with the country and, and kind of stayed there, there's really been a, quite a dramatic decline from two thirds of the youth of the uh, infants being stunted. Uh, to about now 40, 44%, a, 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 big, uh, a, big, a big decline. So even though the population was growing f very fast, um, uh, the, the prevalence of stunting is going down, although I'm showing you the stunting um, uh, in the last, uh, in the last uh, uh, 20 years. So that's kind of the, the, the paradox. So what I'm saying is you just can't associate population growth with uh, with stunting and with under undernutrition, this is now. Who said they work with IFPRI? One of you, yeah, you work with IFPRI. Okay, this is the IFPRI uh, Glo Global Hunger Index, which combines uh, underweight, uh, under five mortality, and, and 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 undernourishment. And you can see that in fact, some of the big countries. Here's Ethiopia, the Global Health Index declining from 40 something into the 20s in this 22-year uh, period. Nigeria not doing pretty, doing pretty good, and Ghana. But you do have uh, countries like uh, Kenya, well, South Africa's are, but Kenya and a few others, like DRC, uh, who, that are not. But most of the countries, in terms of this now very popular hunger index, which combines these three important variables, uh, you, see, you see quite a bit of uh, of change. Now, this is, again, prevalence. This is not numbers. This is a prevalence. Um, the reason why we can be confident that we know that things are improving is that we don't just, like in the U.S., ask, oh, have you ever felt hungry? Has, has your child ever gone to bed hungry at night? Or have you ever, have you ever feared being hungry? We actually measure, measure the children and and the women, that's called anthropometry. So in terms of the, the height, the, the weight, and the weight, weight for height, you can see that in this uh, period, uh, it's, uh, it's gone down. Here's the stunting, the underweight. The wasting hasn't gone down very, very much. Uh, that is more uh, actually um, of, um, famine and climate change related. There's quite a bit of climate change going on, and we've got have to find a way to uh, counteract it. The overweight, you see, is still very low. But now in Addis Ababa, in the main city, you'd like to know that the percentage of uh, overweight and obese women who are over 30 has increased from 10 to 16 percent. Say it's still low. But have you ever seen a, a, an overweight Ethiopian woman? It's very rare. But now in Addis, we never saw it 20 years ago. And now we're seeing it, and that's, that's social change. OK, I'm not going to go into, this is a, showing just that here's been the demographic transition. This is urban. So that transition happened already 20 in the 80s. But this is rural here. And now it's starting to go down. So the, the transition happens first in urban areas, and now it's happening in rural areas. And that's the way social changes. OK, so finally. Uh, so those of you interested in doing something about this, there are policies and programs. Um, and they can be <clears throat> top down. They can be, they can be bottom up. But the important thing is they have to, it's important that they be integrated. We never say, or I never say, food security. I say food and nutrition, food and nutrition, because food is only one step uh, towards uh, uh, human, uh, human welfare. So we're saying integrated food and nutrition programs, but also it's more than just food and nutrition. It's often education. We're seeing the education, particularly women's education, at secondary level, uh, are, it's very important in uh, reducing the, the outcomes. Once they do get married and have children, their outcomes are 
a lot better. So we work on both sides. We work on the food and nutrition side, and then we work on population and family planning and reproductive health. And the, the, the prevalence, uh, the percentage using family planning was only 4% when I arrived in 1990, and now it's about 30, 30%. So the percentage using family planning has really risen. Why? Well, because they're urbanizing, they're becoming educated, and there's what we call agency. The youth want to be different. The youth don't want to starve like their parents and grandparents. They don't want to, <clears throat> uh, they want, their, they're looking for, for hope in their, um, uh, in, their, in, their, in their future. So part of the, <clears throat> in terms of population and reproductive health, um, example, trying to address some serious problems of early marriage. Uh, pr the, the mean age of marriage uh, was about 15, 16. And, and now within 10 years, it's risen to 18 and 19. And actually, there's been a law uh, rise, raising the legal age of marriage from 15 to 18. And amazingly, it's being enforced. <clears throat> Who's enforcing it? The girls themselves are enforcing it with the help of their teachers, their, their priests, their imams, uh, and others uh, actually in the uh, community level of the uh, government. But it's no good getting an education if you don't have land and if you don't have <clears throat> skills and job training, so that's one of one of one of the big one of the big issues. <clears throat> I think this is Ethiopian coffee, incidentally. I think it's Yerke Chefe. <clears throat> okay, so w there is a there is a problem that the chal big challenges though is that <clears throat> the demographic transition which can lead to a positive development is not a smooth, it's often not a smooth curve. It can be like this. And it could be for some populations and not others, okay? So some of the countries like Kenya, for example, was far ahead in the demographic transition until 1990, and then it stagnated, stalled for 20 years. <clears throat> Finally, it's been starting to go down again. We've got to reduce even to prevent the stalls, the, the plateau, or accelerate the, the decline. And these are six ways uh, to do it. Um, promote the urbanization, the integration of the programs with not just food programs, not just food aid, and uh, but uh, women's education, uh, community-based nutrition empowerment of, 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 uh, of households uh, to be resilient, to increasing climate change, uh, the accelerated uh, stunting reduction program. F we're now focusing more on the women than on the children, particularly the pregnant women. When the pregnant women's nutrition has in improved, the birth rate is higher, and the possibility of survival and the stunting of the children is, is much better. In the cities, though, there's growing obesity and overweight. Uh, and that we, the government still has not started programs on that. But in uh, Tikwur Mbesa, the big hospital, uh, there's a new a diabetes award. Never had such diabetes there before, so that's happening. Uh, diversification and, and climate change. <clears throat> okay, so finally, I'm gonna ask for a show of hands, okay? The question is, can vulnerable populations feed themselves by the year 2050? I say 2050 because, particularly focusing on Africa, some of the countries need time to go through the, the transition. Um, so there are, the, there are the optimists and the pessimists. <clears throat> um, the optimists say that the vulnerable populations will be able to feed themselves uh, once the demographic transition has played itself out. The pessimists are saying no, that there's still gonna be many countries, such as Somalia, DRC Congo, Nigeria, even Uganda, which is high fertility, Niger. These are countries still with high fertility and are not entering the demographic transition. Okay, so let me see a show of hands. I'm gonna ask you, 
Which ones of you are optimistic and which ones of you are pessimistic? First, may I see the pessimists? Show of hands. Okay. No, wait now. You gotta you gotta either say pessimist or optimist. There's no no straddling the fence, okay? All right. Pessimist? Okay. Optimist? Mm. Mm hmm. Uh, excuse me, uh, what, what did you say? You said pessimist. Okay. So it's about two thirds optimists and one third uh, pessimists. That's, that's, uh, that's, that, that's pretty good. For the pessimists, you have a lot of condition, there are a lot of, uh, let me say, for the optimists, there are a lot of conditionalities. And here, m with my student, my graduate students, there are a lot of, there are a lot of pessimists, there are actually a lot of pessimists. And actually, about one third of them are here in the States now, or in South Africa, because they have left the, they have left the country. Uh, but uh, there are what we call uh, preconditions for what we, uh, for the term we use, the demographic uh, dividend, that is when fertility declines, mortality and fertility, you have a much greater proportion of your uh, population working age. So with these are eight preconditions. So if you're an optimist, you better work hard on these preconditions. Uh, that fertility does need to decline and even faster. You've got to prevent the stalls in some of these some of these countries. The UN has even revised its its projections of fertility decline has 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 actually slowed down the rate of the decline in quite a number of countries. Urbanization. Urbanization is really important. A lot of the countries are still majority rural. Now a lot of countries don't want uh, rural people going to urban areas, but uh, social change does happen in urban areas. The number three is the employment. Uh, they're going to leave the country if there's not productive employment or, or, or land. And number four, very important, is what we call aspirate or youth agency, that the uh, young generation, and I know it, our CNR students, our students are so different now than 20 years ago, uh, that they really want, they really are highly motivated to, uh, to, uh, to be much better off. Migration, we are advocating at the UN in New York now for migration to be one of, youth migration to be one of the drivers of development um, and also to, to, to circulate. Uh, number six, the, the food consumption. Uh, one of the biggest problems in trying to feed the world is not necessarily the, well, the population growth rate is declining, but when you go to urban areas, and you have more people who are in the middle ages, uh, the middle age group, then there's a higher consumption. There's a higher consumption of, of grains and uh, that higher consumption of, of uh, foods that are often environmentally uh, unstable. Climate change is the big elephant in the room. This is scary. I don't know if you read the report that came out yesterday. That is scary. Now, there are something like 15 big cities on the coast in Africa. Now, half of them are probably going to be underwater in uh, 50 years. What are we going to do with Lagos, uh, uh, Durban? Uh, so, uh, but we, so we've got to really start working on now, and uh, we have a big conference coming up next month in, in Thailand trying to address what we call adaptation and, and resilience. And finally, political stability and better governance. As I said, most of the countries in Africa that are not going through the demographic transition or not able to lower their proportion of, of, of malnourished is because of a lack of governments or a lack of governments or <laughs> political instability. And I point again to Somalia and DRC. Uh, and it used to be also Sierra Leone was, was doing very poorly. But countries uh, with that type of stability and better governments do, do a lot better. Okay, so uh, that is basically the message we have. So two thir one third pessimists, including yourself, and two thirds optimists. Now it could be that people might be in the middle, but that's not, not good enough. You cannot be in the middle. Uh, maybe you can be a realist 
okay? And you can say, well, it depends. You know, why is, why is Nigeria doing so poorly and its neighbor Ghana doing so well? Why is Ethiopia doing so well and Somalia doing so poorly? R neighbors, okay? So when you dig down, a lot of this is location, 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 contextual. I mean, why did you come to GW? Did you come for, because GW is so great or because Washington is so great? Well, anyway, that's a, <laughs> you don't have to answer that question. Okay, anyway, so now is the time for questions. I don't know if Jose Andres is here yet, but uh, can we have a few uh, questions, please? Can I hear from a pessimist? I'd like to hear from a pessimist of, of why you're pessimistic. And let me hear from an optimist. There you go. I turn it. Mm -hmm. And I want you to decide. No, no standing. No, nothing. And no straddling the, straddling the middle. Yeah, go ahead. Um, What's your my, name, please? My name's Eric. Um, I guess I'm a pessimist because I guess a lot of the reasons that nothing's been done before has been like government corruption and a lot of things regarding that and um, like so mistreatment. So number, you're saying number eight? Yeah, and okay. mistreatment of like minorities and things like that. So why do you think any of that's gonna substantially change? Because I guess if, some, if a population is gonna feed itself, it needs government, it needs a lot of government intervention to at least for financial reasons to be able to feed itself. So, um, in order to do that, you really need a lot of political stability, and that hasn't been seen for the past, since independence for a lot of African countries. Okay, let me hear from an optimist. I think that's a valid point. It's number, number eight. Uh, and um, uh, anyway, let's hear from an optimist. Why are you optimistic? Hmm? Can I hear from uh, the Ethiopian in the back? Why are you optimistic? I'm a pessimist. Huh? I'm a pessimist. <laughs> you see, that's why he's here. Uh huh. No, no optimists want to uh, look at the Ethiopian case. Why the the hungriest country in the world 20 years ago has had is meeting the MDG targets for poverty reduction hunger uh, and uh, underweight, even though uh, governments has, governance hasn't been such uh, a great deal. It's been a pretty autocratic uh, country. So those, yes? Okay. Uh, yeah. I guess I feel a little biased because I'm actually in global nutrition now, which is the course oh. that you t kind of teach. So I've heard a lot about this. But I think I'm an optimist because I think in the past there hasn't been as much an emphasis on like monitoring and evaluation and now they have kind of like real data driven interventions that work and something like the multi or the MDGs are kind of like uniting different countries to kind of commit their governments and kind of have more a multi-sectorial approach rather than some of these kind of like top down approaches before. Okay, I I think it's really interesting. Uh, obviously, she's taking our class in uh, international food nutrition programs. But you can see that there's, been a, there's also been a change in how we deal with the situation from what was presented last week in terms of food aid, which often, see, often is dependency creating, to this, mul as she said, the more integrated, multi-level, multidisciplinary approach trying to deal with the root causes of, of hunger, poverty, and malnutrition, and we're monitoring them, and we know what's working, and we know what's not working. So we gotta work harder on what's not working. Well, thank you very much, I'm Mr. Ganalo. Every challenge is gonna become an opportunity. I told you two weeks ago, I just came back from Haiti, and so uh, uh, this is uh, my eight, 18th trip to Haiti. And every day I know a little bit more. But there still is so much to learn, right? If we want to be helping people before we begin helping them, we need to make sure that we learn what their issues are so we can really be effective helping them. So today, um, following this class, 
actually I'm not going to be talking to you about food at all. Because if we are not bold in looking at the diversity of issues that are creating somehow the problems of feeding humanity and trying to answer the challenge of how we will feed 10 million people by the year 2050, if we don't start having a very bold look and seeing that the issues maybe are not only food and directly food, but things that are in our, right at the tip of our nose, but because we are so close to it, we are not able to see the issue. And in the moment we are able to step back, we see, oh, it's right here. So do, do we have? with agriculture, with the water, etc., 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 we may not find the future we all look for. So these three rocks, close to three billion people around the world, are cooking with the three, the three rocks in the floor that they will gather some wood. They will put it right there. Or they will have some charcoal if they are wealthy, poor. Because it's poor and wealthy poor. If they are wealthy, they will afford charcoal. If they are not wealthy, they will be playing with wood. So, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, we were cooking like this. <laughs> hundreds of thousands of years later, we have still hundreds of millions of people. While you're enjoying your internet over there, over there, I'm probably tweeting while you're supposed to be looking at me, but you're tweeting with your friend, which is good. So you're able to be tweeting with your friend in India, but we have people that are still feeding the families that we've been doing for thousands of years ago. So development for what? And this is key. If we are not able to answer about these three rocks issue, that's a matter of the great plans in place, we will not achieve success. But I am an optimist, and if you read lately the great letters that Bill Gates and Melinda Gates are writing, they, they have this kind of thing called the myth of poverty. The myth. Very interesting, right? Because it seems that many of us, we are not optimists, and we should be looking at the world like rather uh, as a bright future. Because things are getting better. But if we start analyzing the problems, but the opportunities of the three rocks, the future is going to be even more amazing. So this is very much Prometheus, the man that was able to give, uh, 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 that created man out of clay. That's why I believe I love to cook with clay so much. And if you watch Hannibal on NBC, I have a secret for you. Watch Hannibal on NBC because it's going to be a great moment talking about Prometheus. And I kind of very proud because I created the moment. <laughs> but we love to cook with clay, and I believe because maybe it's true, men came from clay. But then Prometheus gave us fire. So since we were in the caves, all the way to this amazing technology that allows us to control and create these buildings, it's still the beginning, the example I began with. Still our woman out there. 
hundreds of millions of them cooking with red rocks. And we're going to be talking about that's bad, of what we need to do something to change. Today, you and I, we go, we're going to have a steak. I, I love to put the photos, because sometimes I give this class for these. Sometimes they talk about creativity, and it's the same photos. So if sometimes you see I'm a little bit lost, actually, I am lost, and I'm trying to catch up. <laughs> because the amazing power of photos is that you can tell the story you want, and you will look like you know what you're talking about. So this is a good thing. That's why I love photos, so it keeps me going. Um, but the reality is that, take a look at that baby. Take a look at that smoke. Who smokes? Come on, I'm not going to tell you that or not. You want to use smokes? All right. Only one that's good person, please. But the least who does smoke is by decision. Here, this woman has no opportunity of, on her own, decide if she's going to smoke or not. If she wants to be feeding herself, her family, her baby, she has to be using the three rocks. This is reality, people. This is today, around the world. That baby, by the time he's two years old, he's chronic asthmatic. Asthmatic, you call it in English, right? That woman is going to die young, I tell you that. Probably looks a lot older, she is. And I can tell you that every day she did her family with the smoke is what is making her not enjoy her life as a woman should be. Because women are the ones in charge of the families. Where I come from, men feed the families. But in the third world, unfortunately, women have probably to handle, on top of taking care of the family, on top of working, they have to feed the family. And feeding is energy. The same thing that you go and you put in your car gas, how long it takes you to fill up your tank? Three minutes? Two minutes? Right? This is energy. So in the same way we put energy in our car, three minutes, that allows us to go 500 miles away. This woman puts energy in the bodies of their family so they can be up. But she, you're gonna, we're going to see now that it's not three minutes, but it takes her to put energy in the tank of her family. It takes her hours every day. So the smoke, cancer, brown heart diseases, cataracts, burns. So, you know, you and I, I don't know, you, do you know we think? Yeah, if you go to my phone, um, I wait every day. I go on the scalp. So Bluetooth. My wife and kids check my weight. Daddy, the many chicken wings. What's going on? Gin tonics. Come on, Daddy. A guy like me can enjoy technology. But those people don't. If I drink a beer, I smoke. It's by decision. If I'm sick, it's because I'm a stupid guy. <laughs> I just came from the hospital. By the way, just watching the hospital is unbelievable. They had a good friend who had bad news, he had a heart attack. The great news is that he's perfect. So he was very lucky to be receiving first class uh, service from the, some of the best doctors in the world. And he was very lucky. A very healthy guy. Doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, sports. It's very healthy. It's my food. <laughs> so, it's people that don't have the option, right? The ones we have option, this is the end. People that don't have the option, that would be the end too. So we can decide to have a healthy lifestyle. And it's as healthy as we want. We can run. I remember I was probably in the 70s, late 70s, and in Spain, in Europe, the news was that Wow, Americans do something in the morning that is called yoga. <laughs> and this was so profound that they allowed the word yoga in the Spanish dictionary. And believe me, in Europe they are very cocky with their languages. Because if it's not a European language, it's not a language. 
And English, because it's an island, is not considered a language. I'm sorry, you know, sorry, America, I know. <laughs> so they are out jogging in the dictionary. Wow, Americans jog in the morning? Oh, man, there's people are cool. They take care of their health. That was kind of the vision not too long ago. I mean, I never saw anybody jogging in the streets of Madrid. And then in the, you know, in the news, Americans jog. Wow, they run in the morning after, before breakfast. But guys, this is the reality. I'm sorry I keep putting this photo because this is happening as we speak. Right now it's 5 p.m. People are going to go to the sleep in Haiti around in three more hours because the sun will be down and they only use the sun to leave because it's not electricity in many places. If they have it, it's expensive. So right now you'll have the woman, if they were lucky to have two meals in the day, if they were lucky to four two meals in the day, it'll be a moment now to use to prepare the final meal, or the, the only meal of the day. And you'll have a woman like this, making the fire with the three rocks, and began trying to feed her family. And this is death. In the process of feeding themselves, they're killing themselves. And so let me go through the process. Um, I don't know where this photo is from, but I can, I've seen this in first person. And I've been with those kids, rubbing with them. But the amazing thing is that they don't even complain. They are almost happy in a very strange way. It's very funny how, you know, I think this morning my wife told me something like, can you go down and pick up something from the garage? And I kind of complained because it was an annoyance. Like, and then sometimes I go back to these kind of photos and I'm like, my God, how, how lucky we are. So this is many kids around the world, thousands of them. And when their families are very poor, they have no money. So they send them to the forest to pick up wood. And some of them, if they don't bring wood to the school, they don't let them in into the school. Bring in the energy to cook the meal of the day that some schools are able to afford. It's almost a way to pay the right to belong to that school. Imagine that now before you come to the class, you go, have to go shopping, buy charcoal. Wow, it will be fun every morning, right? Imagine every day. Probably you never shop, right? If you are a student, somebody's preparing the food for you. So you can concentrate in the task of becoming the most powerful citizen you can to help society, to help your family, to help yourself, to be an active member of society, right? You are 100 percent concentrated in becoming the best you can through the great education you're receiving here. No option. Deforestation. Obviously it's country that they don't have forests. But when we're talking, talking about the tropical, the tropics of the world, there are big forests. How it is possible that we have a country in the Caribbean, in the tropics, where, um, that because the heavy use of charcoal, do we have the photo of it in the up. So it's funny because when you fly from the Dominican Republic to Port au Prince, all of a sudden, all green, right? Wow, so cool. I mean, the Caribbean. All of a sudden, nobody has to tell you anymore when you're crossing over Haiti. Because you know, it's almost like in the maps that they have lines, right? And you know, oh, here is France, here is Spain, here is Italy, oh, here is Canada. Why? Because in the map is a line. It seems somebody went with a, on the top of a piece of paper and a marker and kind of painted a line on the line. Because it's a very clear distinction between poor, uh, Dominican Republic and Haiti. One is green, the other one is brown. They call the boundary La Linea. La Linea, the boundary. It's so unbelievable. <clears throat> and the reason, it's sharp. As you drive through the country, you will find this kind of white box, kind of waxy white box, I don't know the material. And they're all full of charcoal. And sometimes you will see smoke, little smokes. That's people making charcoal out of all the trees they cut. 
So if we have no forests, if we have no trees, we see that this is going to be having huge uh, implications, natural disasters, not only because we have no trees, but it's going to be part of the issue between or the CO2 that the charcoal is pulling between the lack of trees. So here is a fertile farm. We saw already one of the issues, the smoke, we saw the deforestation. Now take a look, there's a farm maybe in Maryland, maybe in Virginia. Very fertile soil, productive, that's what we want from our land. We want our farmers to, to make a good living out of selling us green peas and artichokes and asparagus. But very much those are often, more often than not, the soils, precisely because the deforestation, the use of charcoal and kind of trees <coughs> creates. Um, when we have rains and we have no forest in the places that are receiving a lot of rain because they grow out of the tropics. And we know how healthy all the root systems, uh, how healthy the, 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 the dirt, the root system uh, creates in the mountains, in the valleys. Uh, roots are what gives life to the land brings oxygen, generates this amazing uh, scenery between the dirt and, and, and the air, uh, animals, creatures, worms and leaves that empower with more energy uh, 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 and creates a fertile soil. The moment you don't have to, <coughs> you have all that water that comes down the hills and because there's no way to be kind of absorbing that water, the water comes down heavy. It comes down heavy and takes away homes homes that sometimes is used four pieces of wood put together, unfortunately it takes down lives. And unfortunately what it takes to what it takes to is the same fertile soil I show you. In the moment the water gets to the plains, but the water keeps going on down, takes out all that layer of soil. So by the time the farmer, whatever seeds they have left, they time to plant, Right there, he has no soil to be productive. And if he plants, probably he's going to have a very poor harvest. So when that water that you see, that that's a problem not many people mention, gets to the coastline, in places that they are supposed to be having some of the healthiest reefs, where life should be plentiful. I'm a scuba diver myself. I love scuba diving. I mean, I've been searching for Nemo all my life. I cannot wait to go to, to Australia. Uh, 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 when my wife loses me in the aquarium, she always has to go to find that fish. All right? I'll be there watching. I think I was Dory in another dive or something. <laughs> but, so we're supposed to be enjoying this. This is life. Uh, how many of you still have that? Great, so you know the life that is generated there, right? And without that, we have no life. This is what generates uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of jobs around the coastline, around the world, it's supposed to be part of the solution. But this is the reefs we enjoy. It's not the only reason, but I'm only now concentrating on the dirty cook stoves, the three rocks, the charcoal, all the issues we are seeing. Already the small, et cetera, et cetera. This is one more. So you go to plant to say, baby, and the fishermen have a hard time fishing. And to me, it's unbelievable that they will have a hard time fishing heavy. Deforestation, charcoal use, et cetera, is what generated, what's creating this problem. So fire, cooking fuel, livelihoods, health, wellness economies, safety, and the environment. All of those things, as one, are affected because we are still cooking like thousands of years ago in the era of technology. Please fascinating. Right? Um, I don't think I mentioned, but what percentage <coughs> of the salaries of the salary that a woman, a man, a family makes in one day? What's the percentage you think goes into the energy to cook the food, the charcoal, the wood, 
What's the percentage of this? More or less, uh, let me give you numbers. More or less, America, I think, is at 36,000 this year, what we call the GDP, the, the income per person. We spend roughly the average is 3 4% in gas for our car. Yep. To give you a number, 3 4%. If you have to light a fire, because you are in a campfire, right, at the end of the summer with your friends, all your buddies from George Washington, and there you're doing some marshmallows and the chocolate thing, whatever you call it, that thing. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> when you do, I'm doing this course with a graph in many restaurants. So what's the cause of that match? Used to light that fire. What's the cost? Which is the middle of it. I'm, I'm only talking the moment of creating the fire. What is free because many restaurants <laughs> until now they used to give you even the matches for free. So this is cheap like that, you will say. But then what will be the cause out of the wood of the chart? It's many numbers, it's many studies, but me I'm a guy that loves reality. So I go and I know I annoy the poor woman with so many questions with my French, they speak Creole, it's a mess. She doesn't know what I'm asking. But searching for the reality, the truth, not what the numbers at the United Nations page tell you, or what a study of uh, uh, an anthropology professor told you, that's important. But me, I like to go and on my own find out. And when you find out that a woman one day made $2.50, and she spent $1 on a pot of charcoal, this is over close to 50%. The families can be spending between 25 and 40 percent a day on the energy to cook the energy to feed the families. Are we crazy? How are they going to be moving up? Imagine that you had to spend 30 percent to cook the ugly hot dog you eat every day, or the cereals that you are eating every day with the milk. It's unbelievable. 30 percent of your income on the energy that is supposed to cook your energy, you began your day in negative already. You are minus 30% before even you wake up. No, I mean, it's no wonder that you find some woman and some man in the floor resting because they are saving as much energy as they can. Especially if those children have to start waking up at 6 a.m. to look for the wood. They have to spend personal energy to pick up energy, to cook the energy, that at the best is gonna put them break even for the day. But no, no even covering the calorie needs of the day. Think about it, it's, it's terrible. So, this is a beautiful beach in Haiti. This is a structure. This is what happens when, after destruction happens, the camps began being formed, and international aid, as good it is, and especially America is one of the most generous countries in the world, period. But we need to start thinking not about doing good anymore, we need to start thinking about doing smart good. Doing good means huh, you feel happy today, and you have shoes at home, and you give the shoes to the church. Why? Because you, you're cool. You are playing in the college team, Hey, George Washington did, did well this year. Too bad. <laughs> anyway, and, and they're giving you shoes, and you have so many shoes, you don't know what to do. And you give me shoes. The shoes. Oh, you feel so good. Huh? You tweet, I feel so good today, I gave my shoes away. It's smelly, but I gave my shoes away. You feel good, right? And the shoes get to the market in Haiti. And actually, you have few families that they have a factory that makes shoes. Because you are doing good. You're putting all these families out of here. Because they cannot sell a shoe. Because these shoes arrive at the church. And they give them for free. And they give them for free. You that were the only one employing anybody in your little village, maybe, you are out of a job because a very smart white boy called Jose, that his friends are from the MBA and give him shoes for free. He was feeling so good that he began giving shoes for free to everybody. Hey. But then Jose would grow older, would forget about the poor people of Haiti. I broke the two, three, four all, only families that they actually had a business that was employing people and kind of selling 
I'm buying, I'm saying I'm doing certain economic, but trying to do good. I was actually doing the worst, which was killing an economy in a tiny town that was the only thing moving the things forward. So when we see these camps, which were many in a place like Haiti, and now we see many in Syria, we see many around the world, if we don't have the right clean books, though, many of these could have entire fires that used to happen not too long ago in the 19th century with when the cities were built on wood, like we saw in San Francisco and many other cities around the world. A true danger to people. But again, going back, this is how people feed their families. And here we come to, we've been talking about the negatives, right? Let me tell you all the positives. Happens that is something called clean cook stoves. This is a dirty cook stove. This is what is called an improved cook stove. Why improved? Because we use charcoal or wood, but because it's created in a way that the wood is not open and the combustion just happen crazy and the wood goes like, wow, in one minute. No more wood, we have to put more. This allows the perfect combustion. The right amount of oxygen, the right amount of air creates the perfect atmosphere for the charcoal and or the wood to give even more power, but at the lower rate of burning down. So this is what we call improved cook stove, because more often than not can save 40 to 70 percent of the charcoal and wood that the families use. What you see over there, it's a clean cook stove. Why clean? No charcoal? No. I'm not 100 percent supporting solar, only because imagine the day that it's cloudy, <laughs> we will have a rebellion. Everybody behind will say, what do we eat today? But I love to bring this as an example of the perfect drink. And I know one day somebody out there, probably in this room, will have the right brains to know how we can bring down this totally untapped potential of the sun. Yeah, this is me. So, my new favorite daughter's. Uh, um, uh, what was the name of the movie? Yes. Ah, you know, you watch movies, good. <laughs> I love the second one, I can't wait for the third. Okay, okay, okay. So, so I, I am I'm crazy for those, right? But anyway, only to tell you that there's hundreds of companies around the world developing the clean book stuff. So, why I'm putting this? Because a clean book stove can be, could be, will be the Trojan horse of maybe feeding the world better and solving many of the issues we find today. And I'm a cook. I'm only as the ingredients I have, but I'm only as good as the kitchen I have. So imagine when all of a sudden I'm gonna show you that the kitchen is at the heart of many of, this, of the problems, of finding the solution to many of the problems that we face today. So. I mean, no, I mean, right? I have power. I'm almost like Harry Potter with his bomb, right? Like, I have powers. This is like powerful. If we use it in the right way. So this is a, a, a school, like um, a, um, a canteen we created. So take a look at those women compared to the ones before. <laughs> nice, clean, sending the message that there is no charcoal. Or if there is charcoal, is a healthy combustion because we're using an improved cook stove. Uh, this is some of my team pastry chefs. This was a bakery we opened in Haiti. We invested. You remember what I told you before when we give shoes for free? You know what happens with international food aid sometimes or aid in general? We go white man mentality. We throw money at the problem. We have money, we come, we go Africa, we bring down, no, hey, we bring money, and we bring a soccer stadium. I've seen them. And five years later, they didn't play one game. Why they build a stadium? Oh, because they wanted to make people happy. Okay? You don't have 
have food, they don't have schools, <laughs> and you build them a stadium to make them happy. This happened today. And these people with good intentions, they're trying to do good. They're not doing it the smart good. I'm not trying to tell you now I have the solution, because I'm taking the hard road. But this is the theme of a bakery. We train them. It's an orphanage, 80 kids, uh, handicapped, so they need four people to take care of every kid. So we create this bakery. Last month, we made a thousand dollars. We, at the beginning, we lost money, like any business. But we're trying to do a smart group, sustainable all the way. I did the investment. I'm not trying to keep throwing money at the problem. And that was a trip. So this is a clean book stuff. That's with LPG. That's with gas. What's happening? Why we don't have, like, Dominican Republic has gas? Why have we not? Because it's this kind of moment in life that people are making cars for the rich. No one is interested in making cars for the poor. People are building kitchens for the rich. No one is interested in making kitchens for the poor. Because if the margins of earnings is 10%, it's not much better to make 10% of a $3,000 kitchen than in a $30 kitchen. So until we don't solve this problem of how the big corporations will start producing very affordable kitchens, for the poor people of the world, we will never solve the problem. So when I have sometimes companies coming to tell me, hey, you wanna come to give us a speech here? I'm like, I will, if you pay me that fee, and if on top of that, you help me in achieving that. And the moment I tell them this, it's not like they don't wanna pay me the fee, they will double my fee. But to try to help you with bringing them affordable energy. No. But you are an energy company. Yeah. Do energy for those people. And that's a reality. That's a problem. So when you become the CEO of one of the big energy gas companies, remember my words and call me, please. Because when you become the CEO, that's the way you will do it. Change if you behave as you will behave with anybody else. You are not only going to give me energy, you're going to be giving the energy to those that need it the most. Are we clear? Um, so I'm showing you these photos because these, uh, I, I'm very passionate about these, not because I'm a cook, and I know how to cook the bit, but because they named me ambassador of the Alliance of Clean Cookstones. <laughs> <laughs> and what that means, that by the year 2020, we're trying to bring 100 million in proof of clean cookstones to 100 million households we potentially can change the life of half a billion people and impacting the planet. Are you with me? So look at this. It's not this different feeling. A small house, rural, a lot of money, the mother cooking. But even if that kitchen doesn't seem like very high tech, that's an efficient kitchen. The smoke goes out, keeps the home warm. The mother is healthy, the, student, the, the children are eating or are becoming better students because they have more time to be studying. Instead of having cities polluted, like the photo above, we will have cities that we want to actually live in, only because we are taking care of the clean cook stoves. Especially women, because there's many small uh, children that are women, instead of picking up wood and sometimes getting in danger, because they go along and things happen to them because they are unprotected. And they may be, you know, in the, one of the neighborhoods I work in Haiti, the government was so brilliant with the IDB, and I'm a good friend of the president, but I cannot wait to see him to tell you. They spent $3 million, $4 million in trying to improve a road, which is not a road like you and I know. It's only like they, they got this big piece of machinery and use they kind of trying to flatten down a little bit, kind of, oh, we're doing good. They spent $4 million. In the process, it didn't work. In the first rain, the entire road, even was worse, broke down because it was made of dirt. The dirt came down to kind of the side of the river. And the only fountain available 
far hours distance walking, walking distance, the entire fountain was covered. A natural made fountain. No, invested by the government. So, unbelievable. Those kids may be walking for two gallons of water because they cannot handle more when they are small. Two, three hours every day. Only to drink. Forget taking a bath. Take a look at the difference now. This is reality. This is not like a happy photo. This is what we can change if we start bringing improved bookstores. All of a sudden, we will have forests that will bring diversity, will bring, uh, uh, we, uh, will strengthen the soils, will give amazing shallow, will give productive fruits, etc., etc., etc. When the waters come, the water will not go down, taking out the fertile soil. The water will not end in the sea, in the coastline, breaking down all the amazing pro productive life chain that we need, you know, to keep a uh, healthy, uh, Country. And all of a sudden, how many of you are in business? Oh, take a look. I got your business, people. We're going to be creating the Apple stores of the clean book stores for the third world. Wouldn't well, this be so cool? It's actually people working on this, going to the poorest neighborhoods and trying to create this kind of Apple store. But because people are afraid of seeing something like this, it's like, ooh. Fancy. Like first time I saw an iPhone, I was like, Ooh, will I know how to use this piece of equipment? They will think exactly the same. A big problem though, very quickly, is this. Do I have one marker so I don't F, F, F you up? Okay, this is the price of the three rocks, right? That's price, right? And that's time. Right? So this is the three rocks. It's very cheap, right? How much it can cost you three rocks, right? <laughs> I was even able to afford it today. Cheap, right? But that's time mixed with uh, charcoal. When you start using this over time with the amount of charcoal, at the end it's costing you so much. Right? When you use an improved cook stove, cost you so much more. But over time, you are saving a lot of money. A lot of money. And you use a lot less charcoal. Right? But when you are living day to day, and you don't have a savings account, or oh, your mommy and your daddy to give you a credit card to pay for everything, it's a very hard decision to go here. Because you're not thinking about two months from now. You're thinking about today. So, a store like this can start giving credit, carbon credit, can loan you some money, can tell you if you buy two, I give you the third one free, or whatever else. So people can start putting together money. Any idea like we see here in America or Europe? And let's be close in this. Uh, we will generate employment because we could make these kitchens local, re-energizing the economy. I can look how many positives out of a simple idea. And at the end, we'll have the big industrial life like we have now in Haiti that they are opening many big factories to employ thousands of people at the same time. I wish that one of those factories would produce thousands of those improved kitchens at a very affordable prices. At the end, uh, used to end, that was, that, that was the name of my um, NGO, if you're interested. It's thousands of good NGOs around the world. My message to you, though, is before you join an NGO one day, only try to think about if they are throwing money at the problem or investing into the solution. Because in Haiti, never a country had more NGOs, and never a country had so many problems. So more NGOs doesn't mean that we are improving the lives of the people we think we're helping. So if you're going to be joining and you pretend that they know George Washington donates a lot of time, just be smart about who you give it to. That was the bakery we created. Uh, that was the first day that they produced both, that they sent me the photo. And going back, that was the dirty kitchens we saw. The children we eat out of those dirty kitchens. But this is what we created. This is the first farm I invested. 
Finally, we are productive. We are only able to produce 15, 20% of the foods, but I hope within one, two years, we'll be able to produce 100%, so I don't have to call Tony Lake or UNICEF, hey, can you get me rice? Or that cannot be the way forward. The way forward has to be the difficult way, which is how we can really make it sustainable. Um, this was myself giving a cooking class to this woman that they are coming from other villages because they listen what we do and they want to learn what we're doing. So we give them the green and the red cutting board. That's a gift. It's a little. I, I don't like to give anything away for free because then they take it for granted. But sometimes it's good to keep them going. So the green is for the vegetables. The red is for the meat. It's not like they use the red often because they don't have enough money to buy the meat. Um, those are, um, we began with 60 kids, now we have 175. I hope there's no more coming, because I didn't budget for it. Uh, this is the look of the farm. We went having cabbage, and we tested four things, which are the things they like. I'm not imposing on them. So you know what they did here? They bought the land. I made them buy the land. What I gave them was infrastructure, the seeds, to bring expertise from outside, to choose the right car, the right, uh, the, the right food, the right vegetables. And what you see in the back is a chicken farm. And we're going to start only with 24 chickens. But if it goes well, we're going to grow it. Um, this is some of the amazing people. If you talk about heroes, those are heroes. They've been there in Haiti like 15 years. They were there before the earthquake. They were, I don't know, they were in diapers, I guess, when they were there. Because I don't get it. And this is if you some meal last week. That that's what they get, usually rice, beans, and, and the vegetables that we are able to provide through the, through the market. So guys, this is the end. Think about that. From now on, when you light a match, I don't want you used to waste it. I only want you to think for a second about how we can be empowered, people around the world, by understanding that every match we light, every fire we make, if we make it in the small way, we can be really changing the lives of people. So this is the idea when you think, how can we make sure that the three rocks on the floor become something of 50,000 years ago, and that every human being, every family in this planet will have the possibility of only having a humble, improved cook stoves that can change the lives of so many people. Thank you very much.